I'm Judy Murray. Behind every champion is a driving force. Victoria at her best. Wanting to prove people wrong was something that was a very powerful driving force in me. We all got prepared for how to perform, but no one prepared us for what will happen after. Dina Asher-Smith, the best of British. If you can see it, you can believe it, and you can believe that that could be you. We knew that we were a part of something bigger. More glory for Sarah's story. If you don't stop doing this, you may go deaf. Was everybody else that almost had to suffer because of because of what I did. Stunning stuff, Amanda. Becky, I think you need a sports psychologist. And I was like, why? What's wrong with me? I was a little bit scared when he first talked to us. I knew that there was a massive responsibility. The undisputed I didn't know about the breakdown, becoming a self-harmer, the being depressed. I had no idea what that meant. If you tell me I can't do something, I will go out of my way to prove you wrong. She's a great captain. She's a, an amazing player. Almost a Bobby Moore type for me of the uh, of the ladies' game. Her tactical awareness and her game intelligence is quite incredible. Steph Orton, though, she is so dangerous. You could just see, whatever she turned her hand to, that she would be a leader. You could see that she always had something special about her. I'm sure she'll stand out in the test of time as one of the best England captains as well. Steph Houghton, England captain, Man City captain, and I am so pumped to hear your story and find out who and what led you to become the trailblazer for women's football and the queen of the lionesses. I had to say that, I've been dying Thank to you. say that all day. <laughs> Let's go back to where you started and what and who instilled your love for football. Ever since I could walk or run, it was always trying to kick a ball and playing football with my dad, playing football with my mates in the street. Uh, then my brother was born and it was kind of like a little competition between me and him. Ever since then, not looked back. A big Sunderland fan used to watch them all the time. Obviously heroes like the likes of David Beckham, Steven Gerrard, Kevin Phillips growing up. Always trying to like replicate whatever they did for Sunderland, for England. And the love for football that I have now is still exactly the same as what it was when I was back then. I first realised when Steph had a talent was probably about three or four, whether she was kicking a football, using a cricket bat, a golf club or tennis racket, she was technically very good. Did it occur to you that there was no female role models? Did you think, why isn't there women football? Or were you too young to think about that? Male football was always on the telly. I think naturally you gravitate towards the likes of, say, Kevin Phillips, Michael Owen. They were the players that were the superstars when I was growing up. If I was a young girl now and to have so many role models to look up to, it gives us a lot of enthusiasm to do what I'm doing. If I can affect one young girl that can actually want to start to take up football or be involved in football in some way, shape or form, I've done my job and the, the role that I play. And if young girls were growing up and they didn't have the female role models I have now, it may be playing effect in terms of whether they want to choose football as a career. She's someone I've looked up to. Um, obviously, I've probably quite recently become into the national team and she was a player I always looked up to and always seen as a leader before I even probably knew her quite personally. I think for female um, role models, it's everything. Um, not just for females growing up to be able to aspire and, and be what they, they can see, but for, for men, for, for young boys to say, actually, I really respect women. I respect that that woman can do the same thing as me. I think it's important that they have role models. Um, and as much as the women's game, especially in football, is evolving still, I think we really need to make sure that there's a real push. Women's sport's amazing. It's riding a tide. It's more popular than it's ever been. It's going through this incredible movement. Uh, we have these iconic female figures. I think this team does an incredible job of taking that on our shoulders. 
and understanding the position that we have and the platform that we have within this world. Yes, we play sports. Yes, we play soccer. Yes, we're female athletes, but we're so much more than that. Really exciting women who even transcend their sports and are able to, to speak across a range of subjects um, and, and appeal to really wide audiences. The levels of respect have just gone up every single year because the quality of the game has gone up. The respect levels for what women's football is now, you know, watching the World Cup, it's on TV more than ever. What a goal. A false run out of goal. We are, we are on that journey. If you think about what's just happened in the last four to five years, what's happening with the viewing figures. I mean, the World Cup last year was watched by, Women's World Cup was watched by over a billion people. That's a signal, right? It's a signal to, to media companies as a genuine interest in, in women's sport. In for old Steph Horton. She couldn't score again, could she? This is incredible. Obviously, at the time when she was growing up, women's football wasn't very big on the radar. It was, wasn't professional. It was all amateur. So family played a big part in it. And your dad was, he was a semi-pro footballer. Yeah, uh -huh. Did that help? Did he try to teach you or did he just try and play with you? Oh yeah, he was always the one that was trying to like do little skills with us in the yard and actually still have a little bit of fun, of course, I think. Probably get my competitive side from him. When it came to football, it was kind of win at all costs. And I think the drive definitely does come from my family. And I think they're the only constants that you have in your career, no matter whether I was that four-year-old or a 13-year-old make my debut or being England captain, they're always there standing on the sidelines or watching back home or being on the end of the phone. Right, the difference between being a dad and like the driving force behind over the sport is finding the right balance between being the shoulder to cry on or the kick up the backside and be there, be the taxi, just be in the background there for encouraging. Did you find that your mum and dad, in terms of your upbringing and your football career, did they play completely different roles to each other? <laughs> yeah, massively. They had to play different roles because I think if they were played the, the same role, I think it would have been maybe either football overload or I wasn't pushed enough. So I think my dad was very much in terms of how I was going to develop into a player or whether I still liked the game, whereas my mum, away, away from the game, was all about morals and making sure that I worked hard, I was committed, I was still polite, I was still humble and mm -hmm. I think when you mix them together, I've been lucky, the fact that I've had them two to kind of look up to and kind of follow as well. Was there a school team, a girls team that you could be part of, or was it all mixed? It was mixed when I was growing up. Obviously, you want to play football. At break time, whenever um, the bell rang, everybody would run up to the top yard, which was like a little five-a-side court. And you, if you were first on the yard, you used to play every single game. And until you got beat, I was like, right, OK, well, I'm staying on this yard for 15 minutes. We're not getting beat. I'm, I'm making sure that I'm the person that's on there. And um, it was a mixed football team. I always remember my first game like it was yesterday. It was the best feeling ever being able to play in your first competitive game. It was probably frowned upon by some parents in the sense that I was probably starting ahead of one of their sons. But when you go and score two and, and you play well, you're kind of putting the message out that you actually belong on that pitch as much as anybody else. I went through my whole childhood of playing football feeling like it was a little bit odd because I was the only girl and no other girls kind of did it. Um, it wasn't the thing to do, but um, I just remember thinking, well, I don't care, I'm just as good as the boys, um, if not better than some of them, so why shouldn't I pursue this? The opposition that I was playing against, it wasn't the boys that I was playing against, it was the parents of the opposition, and they, I would hear some horrendous stuff from the sidelines, chop her legs, break her ankles, um, she shouldn't be playing, it's a, it's a boys' game, it's a men's game. When you're a little kid playing, you know, and you're hearing that, it's quite upsetting and hurtful. As a girl, it's almost like we have to impose ourselves by being really good at it to be taken seriously. I think if I look back at my career and obviously the teammates that I've played with and women in different sport that you've come across and you're trying to prove a point, know that you belong on the world stage or an international stage or you're playing for a certain club and that's a probably a massive driver for me, you're trying to prove people wrong and trying to change people's perceptions in the sense of that I'm a, I'm a woman and I'm playing football and I'm playing at a very high level because A, I've worked so hard to get here, but B, I deserve to be here with the talent that I have. People want you to slip up. 
as a woman. People are waiting for you to slip up, and when you do, they'll let you know about it. You do need a little bit of resilience um, to, to feel that you are good enough um, and probably in some ways be more confident in yourself that you can do it um, compared to kind of like the equivalent male. But we've got to keep putting ourselves in that position so that eventually the conditioning just, you know, you just get used to it. That's the challenge. As soon as you get on that football pitch, you're just free to go and be the person and the player that you want to be. When you were young, you went to Easter camps. That was where you first were scouted. You were nine. Nowadays, kids get scouted from as young as four or five. Yeah. Is that right? The way that the game's going, especially in women's football, they've kind of copied off the men's model in the sense of they're trying to pick up the, the most talented footballers that they can at such a young age to try and get them through the system. When I was growing up, these Easter camps, my mum was like, right, I just need you to get out of the house for two <laughs> days. Just go, just go and play football with your friends. Be there from nine until three. And because it was with Sunland and they're, they're my team that I supported anything to do with them, I just wanted to be involved with whatever. and. I absolutely loved it and I'd been on a few and then there was actually a scout when women's football was kind of starting to pick up. We were starting to get a Sunderland team that was there and he asked us to go and train for the under 16s at the age of nine and it was obviously a massive step up but at the same time you're not going to turn that down and it was all worth trying to go to these camps and have a bit of fun but also try and prove to be the best that you can be. There's a whole pathway now for young girls especially at the international setup, um, and also out, out, out further afield in the participation in the grassroots level. I wanted to play for England, but I didn't know there was an England team. But you have this ambition, if you have this ambition now, um, to play for England, you can. The pathway's there. I mean, to see where it is now is unbelievable. But would I have thought, would I have benefited from those youth ages? Of course I would. It would have been a lot easier of a transition. What did, what did that mean, being part of the Sunderland setup? We only really trained once or twice a week, trying to find a pitch where we could train on a Friday night where you're trying to just latch on to the last bit of the floodlight that you can get to be able to train professionally and do everything every single day to the best of your ability. We're in such an unbelievable position as footballers, but back then it was a lot of onus on you. I think once I started to get into Sunderland, it was like, right, OK, well, how can I then progress? And the next progression was to try and get picked for England. And the only way that you could do that is by training a lot more by yourself. And I mean, I didn't like it at first. I didn't mean really you want to go for a run after school. All I want to do was play football, but you've got to make sacrifices to get to the level that, that I'm at today. Was the coach or the person who scouted you, is that someone who you would describe as a driving force in your career? Yeah, of course, I think along with all my other coaches, they all play a massive part at different stages of your life, setting the foundations of the, the person and the player that you wanted to be, which was always about working hard and being the fittest team that we could be. And my Arsenal days, that coach was all about trying to be technical and trying to be a little bit versatile in the position that I played, which was massive for my improvement as a player. And I could go on about, but every single person in terms of coaching wise has played a, a massive part in the career that I've had. She started in midfield when she joined Arsenal um, for us. And then gradually as her career went on, she's moved and become an unbelievable centre half and seen how she's developed and what kind of player that she is, as well as how similar in some ways she is to me. It would have been great to be, you know, two commanding presences at the back for England. I think that's a big learning factor when you're growing up is that you can be in control of what you want to control. Your destiny is, whether it's a professional athlete or whatever it might be, a lot of it is about the work that you put in and the people that don't really see the work that you do. Lockdown was a real eye-opener for myself in terms of the motivation to get out and train, not be with your teammates. It was tough at times, but at the end of the day, I was like, well, if I'm not doing it, somebody else is going to do it and I don't want them to take over my place going forward. The big difference between men's football and women's football 
is in the physicality. The women will never have to play against the, the men, so that doesn't really matter. But why is the pitch the same size, the ball the same weight, the goals the same size, when we are much smaller? We are much smaller. If I look at it as a footballer, I want to be treated the same and have the same pitch dimensions, the same size goals. From a physical point of view, in terms of an aerobic point of view, we have the ability to play on that pitch for 90 minutes. Within tournaments, you're playing seven games within three weeks. We've developed our own strengths in terms of our physical capabilities over the last few years, which allow us to continuously do that. If I'm honest, in terms of training, I wouldn't say it's anything massively different. I think some of it is purely the education of this is what it takes to, to win and the demands of, of being successful at the top level. And I think maybe it's one of, one of probably the things I've focused on over the last 10 or 15 years of working with the national teams is looking at every player as an individual and looking at every single thing that might impact their performance. It's important that we look at our own game and our physical performance and how we can still develop with the help of the sports scientists and all the um, research that's been done. People think that boys and girls pop out of the womb and boys are just biologically programmed to be brilliant at football and girls are not, or biologically programmed to be brilliant at sport. And it's all about strength, you yeah? know? But it doesn't work like that. If you look at, across a rugby team, you know, the rugby players are not all of equal strength. They're all different shapes and sizes. In terms of research on um, female athletes, it's, you know, very minimal, especially compared to kind of male co cohorts. And if you then look at football research, again, there's a, plethora of research on, on men's um, men's football, but again, you look for, for women's football and, and there's minimal there. How important is it to have more female coaches involved in the game? There's a lot more opportunities for female coaches to be part of not just the female game, but the, the male game. Females are putting in as much work as the males to be at the level that they want to be. There needs to be a huge push by you know, UEFA, FIFA, and I know there is, but also the national associations of the respective countries to, you know, have at times female-only coach education, a mentoring system in place because, you know, we, we do need to have that equality and, and more female coaches at the top end. I've been fortunate enough to work under some amazing female coaches and staff. Shelley Kerr was my manager at Arsenal, really put a lot of faith in me to make us a uh, vice captain of such a great club. When I was at Arsenal, um, when I first came in, she played left back and central midfield and right away I had a chat with her and I could see longevity in her career by playing centre back because of her game awareness and you know, I'm so glad that I, I tried her in that position. The likes of Hope Powell I'll, I'll be forever grateful for. Hope was my manager to give us my England debut. Um, she really pushed us hard, she really challenged us as a 17-year-old making the England debut. It's, it was important to not get ahead of myself. It's always about keeping your feet on the floor and being a better person and player, get fitter. Dawn Scott, I think she's the best in the world at what she does. She's won a lot of medals with the USA team. Me and Dawn's been on a big journey, I think. When I first started to go in the England camps, she was always the one that used to give us my training programmes in England. I was very fortunate and I laugh about it with Steph that I actually worst worked her first ever camp where she was actually called up off standby for a youth camp at Lillishall as a 14 year old and at that time we had maybe 18 players in the squad and staff would have to make up the numbers to almost shadow play the opponent so I actually marked Steph in her very first England game. She's a person that I really really like lean on a lot in terms of how to improve my performance and how to get better and I don't think I've ever, ever made her happy or to ever made her say well done because she's always pushing us so much to be even better. To see what she's achieved since then, um, you know, from a professional level, um, being almost the face of Manchester City turning professional and, and being a captain and leader there and then of country is, is just amazing. And, you know, part of, again, my decision to come back was to be part of those players again. Only probably recently in the past few years, I've had a chance to work with female coaches, which probably says a lot. You look at sport in terms of, like I say, the breakdown of, of gender. There is a bias, male, female. You then start looking at the coaches and again, you know, 
the bias becomes bigger in that there's more male coaches compared to female coaches. If I'm taking myself back to the 1990s, and I think you have to establish in that era, we had a woman manager. I don't think I'd have been ready for it. And I can't lie, I'll be sitting here and, and, and telling people what they want to hear. Of course I wasn't ready for that. But the world has changed so much now. They've got a different mindset, a different outlook on how football is and outside of football, how things work. So hopefully people start adapting to that idea much quicker than it has been in the past. I don't think you look at someone and, oh, she's a woman, or he's, he's white, he's black, he's, he's a man. I think you pick the best people and if it's a woman and, and can do the job better than a man, then you give them the job. If you go through the same qualifications kind of pathway and then build up experience, like you've got just as much right to apply for something as a, as a, as a male with the same qualifications do. There will be a women's Premier League manager and why not? Why, why shouldn't there be? I think it would take a brave board of directors, owners, chief executives to make that appointment. What's the difference, or some of the differences, of working with a female coach versus working with the male coaches? Because you're female, you kind of understand how the female mind works. As females, we ask a lot more questions. We want to know the reasons why we're doing certain stuff, whether that's on the pitch or off the pitch. Females generally, like when I noticed when I coached young boys and young girls, the girls would always want to ask a question and just think, oh, why are we doing it? Oh, could we do it like this or that? But the, the guys, the boys would generally just go, yeah, OK, I'll do it and I can do it better than anyone else. Working with female coaches, they understand a woman, you know, they understand what your needs are. There's a level of empathy that maybe comes more with women, female coaches, and an understanding around just how women work as, as people. It's nice to have that relationship with someone where they've been there and done it and they've been through the challenges that you've been through. The knockbacks because you've been a female. I think female psychology is, you have to understand females to manage a female team. In terms of football and for female coaches and, and staff, there's no better opportunity to be involved than now. The advances in sports science and sports medicine have been phenomenal. Things like the menstrual cycle affect us not just physically, but emotionally as well. So many more sports are understanding the effect of the menstrual cycle on performance. The US soccer team brought in a specialist, Georgie Bruinvels, to work with them in the run-up to the World Cup and what a big difference that had made. It's still an area where sometimes it's a little bit of a taboo subject. People don't really want to speak about it. It's part of our life and it's something that within a group of 23, 25 girls, it'll affect people at different times. For years and years, there's been this um, historical stigma and historical taboo about the menstrual cycle. Everyone thinks it's the period where you lose blood and gosh, like that's so uh, disgusting and we can't talk about that, when actually it's a normal physiological process and it's a sign of health. The main part was the understanding of actually what the menstrual cycle does to the female body and how in them different phases you could actually help your performance, help your recovery. Often in some sports, women are out there on their own, aiming to perform day in, day out, and there's so much expectation on them, yet they're just suffering in silence by themselves, thinking or thinking they can't discuss this very, as we've discussed, like historically taboo area. And I think governing bodies need to have an appreciation of, like the menstrual cycle is a sign of health and health has to be a priority. Health, if, if you're not healthy, you're not gonna be able to perform. We're going into an environment where it's so competitive. It's all about trying to get as many wins as you possibly can. I think it's knowing them symptoms and knowing them signs and being able to firstly understand yourself, what they are, and secondly, having them conversations to kind of go, right, okay, well, my back's a little bit sorted here, what can I do? And maybe that might be having a conversation with the physio or the nutritionist say, right, okay, well, how do I get this a little bit better so I'm ready to go? I remember going into one of my college coaches um, and saying, I just feel exhausted because I've got my period. And I was kind of laughed at. Um, this was back in 1997, 98. But I just felt like I couldn't, I knew I couldn't deliver on that day, um, but I still played the whole game. Over the last six or seven months, players are now a little bit more aware of symptoms that actually are probably related to their cycle. And then, um, you know, just using certain uh, strategies to try and minimise those symptoms that ultimately then accelerate the recovery that then can hopefully have, uh, improve their performance.
In 2014, you became the England captain. You were only 26. How did you feel about that massive responsibility? When you get told that you're going to be captain of your country, it's a, a massive honour and everything that you've ever dreamed of as a, a female footballer is to lead your team out. And it wasn't just about me, it was probably more for my family, I think, for all their support and guidance that they've given us to where I am today. But I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit scared when he first talk, told us. I knew that there was a massive responsibility. Just want to make an official announcement in terms of, of the captain moving forward. One well, thing I will say before I say this is that even though someone wears the armband, one of the things I've been very impressed with, and other staff have, is the amount of leaders we've got in the group. Right? So whether that be a young player, a senior player, you have some exceptional leadership qualities and leaders within the group. I'm going to form you announce now that Steph Houghton will be our, our New England captain. The, the key thing about the relationship between a captain and a manager is a trust. The trust and their ability, the trust to be that link between the management, the support staff to the players and she's everything, she's good with people. The captain is your, is an is a extension of you on the football pitch, you know. It's an honour that not so many people get to, in the men's or women's game, get to experience. That England shirt comes with a huge amount of identity. Um, you're representing your country. Yeah, when I see Seth leading the team out in an England shirt, it just makes us as proud as punch. It's just like every parent's dream. You would, you would never imagine it would happen, but when it does, it's just the best. The first six months of my captaincy for the country, I don't think it was my best. I was trying to find my way a bit. I was trying to be someone that I wasn't meant to be. I tried to be everybody's mates. I think the fact that I got it so young and there was players in that squad that had a lot more experience than me that were leaders for their clubs. Maybe people didn't agree with the decision that the manager had made. And Steph has asked if she would say a couple of words to you all, but short and sweet, no pressure. Just on that fact. Um, just delighted to be given the opportunity to lead you girls out. And obviously we've got a big game coming up on Saturday and uh, I'll always do my best. And hopefully I've got the support of everybody in the squad and uh, moving forward, we can hopefully go and qualify for a World Cup. Thank you. Ultimately, for them six months, really developed my leadership skills. I really had to go back to basics, which is where the, the psychologist came in and was like, right, OK, Steph, we have to really go back to why you got picked as captain, what makes you the player that you are today and what makes you the person you are. I think probably the most critical factors for me when I meet people is to get inside their head and see what they're going through and what they've been through and what their beliefs are now and expectations and so on. So you really understand them. And then you actually acknowledge what they've been through and recognise that and, and see what the potential is. And you become almost a massive advocate and supporter of that person. And I think that's the turning point when they suddenly realise there's somebody who actually cares about me. Uh, and for some reason, I don't know why in sport we tend not to say that to athletes. They're human beings and we care about their well-being. I'll always be forever grateful for that conversation because I think without that, my captaincy wouldn't have been as long as it has been. Let's understand the machine you've got. Then let's get some insights into your uniqueness because we're all unique then learn how to manage that unique machine and finally apply it in sport. And that's the order in which I like to do things. I had to go through that experience. I had to have that circle of people who you really trust. The psychologist was one. My husband was another in my family and my best mates that were on the team were people that I really, really lean on. Not just them, but now still. When you had doubts about it or about yourself, how did you handle the pressure that you put on yourself with that? Because I had the armband and I'd been given the captaincy, I expected that I'd be having this man of the match performance every single game, whereas actually, logically, it's, it's an armband and I'm still a player that plays in the team. So it was kind of going back to that basics and right, going, OK, Steph, just make sure you do, let your football do the talking first and foremost, just train as hard as you possibly can. I remember when I did meet her first time after, you know, she'd been in it for about a year, I was like, how are you, you all right? Like that, and it's that kind of, I know, are you all right? Because of the extra responsibility. And she's like, yeah, you, you know, you know, she was just getting used to it all. And yeah, we haven't really spoken about it because I think it's important for that player to do it their way. 
I want to be a leader that led by example with my actions and how I was around camp and I'd like to think my personality, I don't really get too high in situations, don't get too low, maybe when we've got beat, even though I hate getting beat, I'm probably one of the worst people, but I think that added responsibility allowed us to try and be more positive around camp. There's a lot of learning, a lot of hard work that probably people have never seen before and I think it was always about trying to be true to what I really believed in, in terms of being polite, being respectful, being humble, and trying to influence as many of my teammates as possible. But I realised I couldn't just do it by myself. I needed experienced players around to help, and they have different strengths to what I have, and it's about utilising them as much as you possibly could. She's a special girl and was always one that you know, I used to like to spend time with as an older player um, when I was in the squad. But yeah, truly, you know, um, I'm sure she'll stand out in the test of time as one of the best England captains as well. How are you prepared by the club or by agents to handle social media and trolling in particular? We do a lot of work behind the scenes. We always have a few presentations every single season just to kind of get everybody up to the same level in terms of how amazing social media can be, especially for women's, women's sport. It's massively changed how we've developed over the last few years to allow people to follow the game and follow us as individuals and as athletes. But trolling's a, a big part of social media and there's, there's no hiding away from that. I think social media is, is one of the best things that's ever been invented, but also the worst in terms of how it can mess with people's brains, the effects it can have on people. I was very fortunate when I played that we didn't really have it. You'd have phone-ins, uh, maybe people having a bit of a go at you on the radio. For a long time, we've said as players, we wanted this, but it's almost like you've got to be careful what you wish for because with it comes scrutiny and criticism and, and and social media abuse. We've obviously been taught to kind of not read too much into it. And if there's something that really does worry you, it's about making sure that you report it straight away, whether that's via the club, whether that's via your agent and get control of the situation. And it can be quite dangerous and quite scary at times. We could get so fixated on checking your phone after a game, if you had a really good game, telling you the best player in the world. But as soon as you've maybe made a mistake or um, done something wrong in the game, yeah, you crap, you, you shouldn't be playing. I've had to learn that over the last few years. It's kind of finding that balance of what you read and having them people to lean on. That's your family, your coaches, your, your friends. It's, it's my husband to kind of just go, Steph, you had a good game, just ignore what they said or whatever it might, might be. But it can be detrimental to athletes' performances as well. Does racism exist in women's football? There's been previous examples where I've experienced that. You wouldn't wish that upon anyone within sport and in life in general there's just no place for racism or discrimination to see how they are affected it really really hurts you as a teammate because they're there to play football and to play a game and to be discriminated against because of the color of the skin it's not fair on anybody the discrimination uh, that i went through um came very late in my England career so i was already already sort of 80 caps in by that time 11 years in I think that's where it was difficult because I felt like I was being treated differently to other people who had that same experience, who, who were white, frankly. My eyes have been open this last six, eight months, I think like everybody else. And we, we brushed it under the carpet, make no mistake about it. I've worked with Alex Scott and Alex comes onto Sky, does a brilliant job, so conscientious. And we'll often talk afterwards about some of the not just the abuse she gets for being a female on TV, but also for the colour of her skin. And I find that you know, utterly disgusting. I don't see in this day and age how that can happen. If we don't talk about race, nothing's going to change. So when you add the intersection of female and black or a woman of colour, it is even more difficult. You're even further down the pecking order for brands to be associated with you because for some unknown reason race is a difficult conversation that brands, industry, society seems to have. As a sport, as football, I think we have really made great strides in trying to stamp it out as much as we possibly can.
You've had enormous success. What have been some of the curveballs in your career? Injuries is a massive part of any sport. I've had my fair few over the last few years, which have meant that I've missed out on major championships. I missed out on the 2007 World Cup through breaking my leg two days before training. We were supposed to fly out when I was 18. I think I would have been the youngest player there at a World Cup. Absolutely devastated. I missed 2009. I'd ruptured my ACL, which was a long-term injury, probably the longest-term injury I've ever had. I remember when she first came into the England team when she kept getting her call up, she kind of got a few injuries before major tournaments, which was a real, you know, obviously devastated for her, but also for the team, because she would have been an unbelievable, you know, um, squad member. Part of my role as being the sports exercise medicine doctor for the player and the team is to have honest conversations as well, but also to preempt some of the challenges along the way. The part and parcel of the sport, but it doesn't make it any easier knowing that it is part of sport. I think I try to use them times where, of course, my emotions were all over the place. You want to be playing the sport that you love every single day and that's kind of taken away from you. One crucial thing that you cannot ignore when anyone has got a long-term rehabilitation pathway in front of them is the mental health element. In front of us we have two amazing machines when we're working with athletes. We have a physical machine which we need to understand uh, and we have an emotional machine in our heads which we need to understand and both of these machines can play up at times nothing to do with us and this is the big thing I've tried to bring to sport to say that when we look at the emotional machine it will do its own thing at times against the athlete's wishes and if we can join forces to support the athletes while the, the machine may be attacking them or doing all kinds of things then they can learn how to manage that machine. Then were hard times for her because she's just getting into the setup and obviously it knocked her back a couple of years didn't play much football in them two years and that's probably one of the proudest things the way she dealt with both of them because she just got her head down and worked hard and just got back to where she was and got back playing. Started again, really. For me, I learned pretty quickly early on in my career that actually breaking bad news can actually sometimes have a positive outcome. I like to try and think that I use it in a positive way to try and improve myself as a player to get as strong and as powerful as I possibly can and as robust as I can so then I wasn't getting injured. Using that time to kind of go, right, OK, well, I've missed a year of my career putting all my time and energy when I was back on the pitch to go, right, OK, I'm just going to give every day everything that I can give and know that I've got no regrets. If you were looked at where you started with Sunderland and you see the new generation of footballer coming through where all the support system is in place, are you having to use your experience to help them to understand and guide them through the life and business of being a celebrity footballer, dealing with the fame, the expectation. How much is that as a part of it as well as what they do on the pitch? If you do get off the pitch right, that has a massive contribution to how you perform on the pitch. These young girls have got unbelievable opportunities to be the best players in the world. Look at at Man City, the facilities, the coaches that are available, the nutrition we have, the recovery methods, there's actually no excuse to be the best player that you can be. For me, when I was 16 years old, I was just thrown into the senior England women's side because there was no pathway to the senior level. Now there's an under 15 side, under 17s, under 19s, under 23s, and then to the senior side. So there's a pathway that young girls now can be integrated into the system to play for England. Sometimes, from a technical and tactical point of view, if I looked at me when I was 21 and them at 21, they would be in further on in their career than I was in the tactical sense of the world. But I think in terms of mentality, I think because we had to really fight to be where we are, nothing was ever given. You had to earn it. It was all about hard work. You do wish sometimes, could I rewind and go back and, you know, be 10, 20 years younger and start over again? But no, it's something which it needed to be done um, to allow the players to you know, they, they, you know, they commit their whole life to playing for their country and for women's football to grow it, especially the top, you know, the players at England. For these young players coming through, I think it's our role as leaders and experienced players is to try and educate that 
It's not always just going to be there for you. You have to earn the right to get a start, earn the right to be captain, earn the right to come off the bench to play. It's to remember that we've seen both sides of the sport in terms of we've been there at Sunderland where we used to have to pay for our kit, get on a minibus at five o'clock in the morning to drive down to Arsenal to now we're at an unbelievable club in Man City where a lot of the stuff is there and provided for us and we're able to train full time. So, and because the level of intensity and the standard of the players that we have in the league in England and all over the world, them little things away from the pitch could make a massive difference. This is what is so important about the role that you have, that you can instill that work ethic, attention to detail into these young players because of the route that you've come up, always striving to be as good as you can possibly be because that is the message that comes out of you loud and clear. You're a winner, you want to win, and you'll do whatever it takes to win. Yeah, I hate losing. <laughs> Absolutely hate it. I am the worst loser ever. If it's a five-a-side competition, that probably doesn't mean anything. My team has to win. The environment that we're creating, I think, now to be able to play at a top team, the, probably the easiest thing is probably getting to that top team. The hardest thing is staying there. I think the older that I've got and the more competition that I've had in my position and the way that women's football has developed, I've really realised that all them little bits are a, a massive importance. It's probably more important than actually playing the game itself. Do you have to pinch yourself sometimes at the changes that you've seen in women's football from when you made your debut to the life that you live now? women and young girls growing up now, it's, it's a massive opportunity to, to live a lifestyle and to live their football dream and play professional football. Now I'm able to live that, it is, it is a dream come true. How important to you now that you leave a legacy and that you use your profile, use your success to get more girls involved in it's, football? It's massively important, I think. Yeah, I take it really seriously because I'm fortunate enough to be captain of both England and Man City and I know that it's not going to last forever so for me it's about trying to impact as many young girls as possible to know that it's okay to be a female footballer. Sport gives you confidence and it allows you to have more friends and have alliances where you can actually improve yourself individually but also help other people as well. It's brilliant to see because I think it's good that young Girls have role models. Now I'm a father, I have a young daughter, she's five years old, she's really into, into, into her football. Um, I want her to be growing up in the world where she sees people like herself excelling and doing well. Now the young girl who's seven, eight, who wants to play, can get into a team, get coached at such a young age, and she has a picture of Steph up on her wall. I look at Steph Houghton and think, what a leader, you know, and when I think of Steph, my first thought is I think of Tony Adams, people that are just such great leaders. You're not just talking about quantity here, you're talking about quality. Um, I think it's so important that we have role models for the next generation. I had a meeting with Steph Horton here at St George's and you sat there and um, females are walking past and they're like, oh, that's Steph Horton. And probably 10, 15, 20 years ago, that wouldn't have happened. You have to inspire other people and you have to inspire yourself to be even better every single day. Steph, thank you so much for joining me. I've loved listening to you. Your story is phenomenal. You are an inspiration. You're a leader. You're an absolute born winner. And I love you. Thank you so much for joining me today on The Driving Force. Oh, thank you.